pastor today. Thank you for attending with us this morning. We really appreciate you guys. And I pray that you will find this a, uh, a very uh, meaningful time of worship. We are, we are a church that uh, holds worship in, in very high esteem, have a very high regard, because we hold our Lord Jesus Christ in the highest regard. He holds the highest place in, in, in our hearts, in this place. Uh, we want to give him our best. So as you are preparing for worship, preparing your hearts for worship, I would like to call your attention to Revelation chapter 5. I'm going to read from verses 8 through 14. For the reading of God's word, I'd like to invite you to please stand. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, which having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. And out of every tribe and tongue and, and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our to our God and we shall reign on the earth then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne the living creatures and the elders and the numbers of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands and thousands saying with a loud voice Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Amen. This is a picture of worship as it's happening in heaven. Tens of thousands times ten thousand times thousands are singing, are singing this song. And then every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, they are speaking with a voice and are saying these things, blessing and honor and glory and power. With, it's with this image and with this attitude of humility, I'd like to go to the Lord and worship today. I'm going to pick some songs for you today. Let's turn to number 66 in your hymnal. Please put all things aside. This is our time to just really meditate on God's truth and worship Him. Number 66, to God be the glory. Oh, 
gospel that he loved us. Thank you. All right. All right, here we go.
momentary a reminder. Uh, you asked me to remind you that when we close in prayer, thank you. Thank you, Father. But when we close in prayer, you have to do it in front of the mic. You have to do it in front of the camera. <laughs> <laughs> I'll apply the next one over on that sheet, which is 73. veteran Christians to spend time with and just praise the Lord together. It's an amazing experience. Yeah. Now, one thing I did learn from Marita was that in the book of Revelation, the horses we see there are quarter horses, not Arabians. Yeah. Amen? I thought he rode a um, wild Mustang. A wild Mustang? 
Yeah, so, the, so what you're saying is they're making assumptions. Well, no, like in the, in the four horsemen, a pale horse. <laughs> I've got a test for you guys. We're going to go through a couple of tests here, but, oops, I'm sorry. i got to get my, my pointer out of my pocket here. Uh, I want to start by, by thanking everybody that's had a part through prayer or activity or anything in our services today. Uh, from our early men's meeting to the men's meeting to the Sunday school and, and now to what was done in the song service and the prayer. I have been absolutely blessed by what you guys have done today. And uh, I thank you. Uh, my heart is uh, just happy to, to know the Lord and to be with this specific group. Um, Merlin and Marita, I think they're resisting the temptation to join our church. <laughs> Uh, even from a distance. Um, I think this group of folks, when we get to heaven, the first church God is going to call out is Sage Creek Bible Church. Come on down. But there's a special category for special people, and you two are in it, and, and, and um, yeah, and there you go. We don't care. Yes. Nebraska is nothing more than northeastern Colorado. <laughs> well, you have the right one. I got my date wrong. You have the right one. Thank you. <laughs> Our <laughs> IT <laughs> section's on it. So no, that's the right one. Yeah. I'm sorry, Lauren, but you are correct. Someone once had a very profound statement. He said, I am interested in the future because that's where I'm going to spend the rest of my life. Right? right? I'm interested in the future because that's where I'm going to spend the rest of my life. Years ago, some of us from the 60s, child, children of the 60s and, and that era, remember a, a group called Fleetwood Mac. Oh, you remember I them? Love them? Huh? I love them. Yes. They had a song that said, don't, it was titled, Don't Stop. What was the rest of that phrase? Thinking about tomorrow. Thinking about tomorrow. Don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Today, today, if we study tomorrow, we're going to see what God is up to. Understanding and insight into what God is up to, to me, when I look at the scriptures, okay, and I'm thinking of the fabric of the church across the United States of America. What are we missing today? Why do we have whole areas that don't even have an evangelical Christian church. Why is that? I think it's because we as a church have lost our desire to look to the future. We're so busy with, um, as I was talking to Duke, we were talking about our fog machine, you know. Uh, we're so busy with the nonsense that we've forgotten why we're here. Christians, churches across our country, if we would look to the future and preach the future, tell them that Jesus is coming again, tell them that someday the church is going to disappear, and then what's going to happen to the world? Lay out God's plan, because he has told us what it is. If we will do that, I think we will see the great awakening that we desire to have. I think we'll see the revival within the churches that we desire to have. I think we as a church, and I'm talking all the church across our country, maybe across our oceans, we have stopped looking to the future. We have stopped thinking about today. Also, understanding what God has in the future, I think it will ignite the fires of revival and, re and an awakening in people's hearts like never before. We need to preach the future in order for the present to have the fire that we want to see for preaching the gospel. What is God up to? Well, he tells us what he's up to. And I think that's why he does. What does the word hope mean in the Bible? Confident, Confident expectation. Confident expectation. Thank you. That's a pair of tens right there. Book and tens. <laughs> I'm telling you guys, 
If we preach the future, the present will fall into place. Next slide, please, Lauren. So in taking on the subject of the book of Revelation is, and, and, and what we're going to do here, we're going to join some of the most, what I consider to be the most brilliant scholars in history in their quest to see what is ahead. What is ahead? You know, archaeologists, when they dig in the Middle East, in these pagan cities that they dig up, the one thing, almost 90% of everything they dig up has to do with those people seeking what is to come. It's something within us. The human soul desires to know what's coming. And you know what? Our great God has told us what is coming. Now I'd like you to uh, explain to me or puzzle through this verse with me for just a minute. This is Daniel. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 1. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? I got this uh, thingy. Is it okay? Okay, Justin says I'm okay. Okay, so Daniel 9, 1. Puzzle through this with me, okay? In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, this is the prophet Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Puzzle through this with me and see. Tell me what you see when you look at these verses. These two verses. Tell me what you see. What do you see? Prophecy. Yeah? We see prophecy. Yes, we do. What do we see? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Daniel was looking to the future. Yes. Jeremiah. Yes. He wanted to know what was to come, and where did he go to find out what was to come? Where did he go? Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Where should we go? The book. We should go to the book. You want to know what's coming? Go to the book. And this is, the, to me, one of the greatest lessons of the prophet Daniel. Understood by the books. Not by some soothsayer. Not by some pastor who's got some fancy ideas. Daniel went to the book. He went to the book, and that is our challenge. I am, uh, uh, I am committed to, the, to Daniel's approach to figuring out what God has ahead. I'm going to go to the book. And that's why we are now going on from our studies of prep into the book of Revelation. So as Daniel studied the prophetic writings of Jeremiah... What did he realize as he was studying it? What did he, okay, he tells us here. What did Daniel realize as he studied the book about Israel? What did he realize? The, the future. future. Is numbering, numbering the number years. of years. The number of years. Did, do you think this is pretty specific? Yes, absolutely specific. He learned that God was going to exile uh, Israel for 70 years. Now, he having been there from the beginning of the exile, it's simple math for him to add things up and say, okay, God is going to end this exile here. So he had it figured out. He would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Since, as I say, he was a part of that exile, he knew that the time was getting close. It was drawing close to God making his next move. And Daniel wanted to know what that next move was. So he is in the book. So um, uh, uh, this, is, this verse to me is so important because it tells us how to look to the future, how to see what God is up to by following the, uh, the process or the procedure of the master of it, and that is Daniel. He went to the Bible uh, and understood that. Now, Jeremiah and Daniel. Remember we studied how these guys overlay? Half of Jeremiah's life was, his last half was the first half of Daniel. So they overlapped. They overlapped. Ezekiel is in there. And of course, Daniel went to the book of Isaiah, found stuff out there too. But this should be us. This is my challenge to you. This should be us. We should have our noses in the book. We should be studying our Bibles. I'm telling you, when is God going to come back and take us out of here? Anytime. 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 
And we should be ready. We should be ready. So that's what I'm calling you to do today, is to be ready for the return of the Lord when he comes and takes us out of here. You don't want to be caught by surprise. Have your nose in the book. Study the book. Figure these things out, okay? That should be us. Now I've got another verse here. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15. Be diligent or study. Your old, your old, your, your old uh, King James will say study. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And the word here translated rightly dividing occurs nowhere else in the Bible. It's a unique word. It means to cut straight or to divide right. And that uh, the suggestion here, it may be to a steward who was making a proper distribution to each one of his, uh, under his care for whatever he was overseeing or dividing. It would be like Merlin and I. Granny made this uh, uh, breakfast stuff. And uh, Merlin and I rightly divided it. 50-50. Right? We, we rightly divided it. And, and the ladies trust our, our eye as a steward of that, right? What did the ladies eat? What huh? did the ladies eat? They didn't. Well, <laughs> that's a hard question there, Lauren. As we study the Word of God, and we go through this now, we need to do like Daniel did and cut straight and divide right. Okay? That's what we're going to do. Uh, if we do that, we can see that time is drawing to a close. It's drawing to a close. We as Christians need to be telling the world, time is drawing to a close. Amen. It's coming. Amen. It's coming, okay? And like Daniel, we should be looking for God's next move. Yes, ma'am. We're going to get to that. Excellent question. Excellent question. Uh, we're going to solve that, I think, as we move forward here. Uh, because we're going to define some words uh, that lay this out, Becca. Some words that I think Christians get confused, like latter days and end times. And we're going to, we're going to go through some definitions so that you can get your brain around that. It's difficult for me, but, uh, but we're going to go ahead and teach that. Thanks for the question. Uh, and when I get these questions, just understand, I do make note of them, and we do work toward answering them if I can't, if we have not at that spot right now. Next slide, please, Lauren. You can see where we're at on our timeline here, where you guys, did you see the slide, go back. Did you see the slide transition? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I did that. It was perfect. Thank you. I did that. Thank you, Justin. For your teaching. You are here. We're going to look at the covenants fulfilled. Your journey through the Old Testament has taken you from Eden, the Edenic covenant, to Adam, Abraham, Moses, the Palestinian covenant, the Davidic covenant, the New Covenant. It's all there. You've been through all of that. Now, what I want to do is take the data that you have gained in all of those studies and put it together in a package, put a bow on it, so that you've got the entire picture of what God is up to. That's what we want to do. And that's what we're going to do. Yes, sir? Yeah, lest our uh, visitors think that we're in the Church of Latter-day Saints or something, can oh. you explain why we have this, this overlay on top of the Oregon Trail? Oh, the Oregon Trail. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Oregon Trail was... Uh, uh, honestly, I tried to think of a way, because as we went through these covenants, you know, we started here and got here, the Abrahamic covenant, uh, I would say that's probably the key to things, uh, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, as it lays out God's commitment to his chosen people. In the Mosaic covenant, he expanded that, and he defined in the Palestinian covenant the land, the properties, everything he was going to deed to Israel. And then you get to the Davidic covenant where we see that King David uh, and his descendants, one of his descendants would be on the throne in eternity. Then you get to the new covenant where basically God puts it all together for us and shows what he's going to do for Israel. Now you are here in these covenants fulfilled. 
And when we walk away from our study in the book of Revelation, I want you to see the part that Israel plays, the part the church plays, and how God has laid out this master plan and he has revealed it to us. Why the Oregon Trail? Um, he was born. Yeah, it was just because it was a, a laid out path to move forward. That's what that is. And of course, that's me and Granny's covenant. We got married in 1977. And that's our covenant right there. So that's how that is. Uh, I have enjoyed your, your company on this trail. Granny thinks that if this was the real Oregon Trail, she would have been dragged across the prairie in a schooner wagon under a piece of canvas from here to wherever. Kicking and screaming all the way. Yep, following in the dust of Merlin and Marita's wagon as they go out east, out west too. Um, but honestly, I am astonished at how much God has told us about what is to come through these covenants. He has laid out his plan, and now what we're going to do in covenants fulfilled, that's where we are, we are here, we're going to put it all together. Next slide, please, Lauren. This is a test question. Who does God really say owns the land that Israel occupies? Who owns it? The Jews. Yes, Israel does, by the covenants. God made covenants with them, so don't forget that. As we go into the book of Revelation, that is a key piece of knowledge that you must know. Who owns the land of Israel? Israel does. Deeded to them by God. Is there a future for the Jewish people in God's plan for the world? Yes. yes, absolutely there is. The covenants tell us that in a time of God's choosing, Israel will again take center stage. Right? And then what does the future hold? Well, understanding those covenants that we went through one at a time and parsed them out, that's what opens the door to understanding what God has in mind for what is to come. His plan is laid out for us. Christians, it's all here. He tells us everything. He tells us everything that we want to know about what the future is. So understanding the fine print, remember we went through the fine print stuff, of these covenants lets us know what God will achieve when he wraps up world history. 1 Corinthians 2.16 says to us, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But what do we have? We have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. Everything he wants us to know is in this book. And everything there is to know is in this book. So it's in the way that we've approached uh, our studying of the Word of God that we can gain that insight into the mind of Christ. He really has revealed to us all we need to know. And now as we go into the book of Revelation, we'll see how it all comes together. Uh, slide five, please, Lauren. The questions then are, when will God make his next move? When he's ready. Huh? When he's ready? Yes. Yeah? Yeah? I like that answer. That's a great answer. Uh, these questions are kind of on the mind of everybody today. When will God make his next move? How will he do it? The rapture. With the rapture? Okay, yes, sir. You, by the way you word that, you insinuated that he has stopped moving. He has not stopped moving. He is just doing smaller moves to work out his plan. He All right. is constantly moving. I think you're right, Greg. But you're stealing my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give you back the lightning. Thank you. I'll give you the lightning bolt. Who has the pointer? You or me? Who has the pointer? I have the pointer. Yeah. Thank you. That all religions lead to God. Oh, okay. So that well, well, obviously we would have a little issue with that, right? But these are things. When will God make his next move? He's revealed them to us in his word. Not to the point of I'm saying, well, he's going to come back tomorrow. We're going to talk about that. But everything he wants you to know, don't you think it's here? Everything God wants you to know is right here. 
And we're going to dig that information out of the Word of God because as we do, and as we see God, first of all, what brings me confidence and comfort is that God has a plan. Did you ever go into a project where you don't have a plan? Like building a kitchen. <laughs> where you don't have a plan. That's your fault. That's not my fault. I tried to work that out. God has a plan and he has you involved. But before I tell you when God will make his next move, Take a look at this. Next slide, please, Lauren. In the Bible, oh, see there? In the Bible, there's a seminary phrase. Oh, by the way, what was your seminary word from last week? Okay. Intercalation. Intercalation, right? We studied that phrase last week. And you guys know what that means. It means that God put a put an extra page in his calendar, which is the church age. And we went through that last week. But there's also something called the law of proportion. The law of proportion. It'd be like Merlin and me getting the, that, that dessert. The law of proportion says we should get the bigger share. Only if Amen? You sow it. And, see, now, actually Merlin told me that. Oh, you got to first sow it and work for How it. How many verses are in the Bible? 31,124. How many predictions in the Old Testament? 1,200 plus. Number of Old Testament verses that contain predictions? 6,641. Number of predictions in the New Testament? 578. But look at this, guys. Number of New Testament verses that contain predictions? 1,711. What does that tell you about our Bible? It's got a lot of stuff and predictions, right? Why would God do that? Why would he do that? So we, Answer me, puzzle me through here. Why would he give that much to us about the future? He wants us to know it. Wants us to know it. That's right. And as in the book of Daniel, Daniel laid out prophecies. Much of that has been fulfilled. About 70%. That should tell us confidently that the rest of it is going to come too. Yes, ma'am. We build our faith. I love that answer. As we see God make a prophetic statement and then see that fulfilled, we learn confidence in God. That's what we learn. We learn confidence in Him. I love this slide because it tells us the percent of the whole Bible that is prophecy, over 25% of the Bible is prophecy. What percent of prophecy is any other supposed religious book? Zero. God is the one that went out on a limb. He's the one that took the risk, if you want to call it that. And then he showed us who he is by fulfilling a lot of those prophecies already. So over a quarter of the Bible concerns prophecy. Next slide, please, Lauren. Are you obsessed with facts? Right? I want to pick one out here. The New Testament books that reference the Lord's coming, 23 out of the 27. Right? People are exhorted. Now, this is what, this is what I, I want to do. If we walk away from this service today, and I have not done that, I have failed at my job. I have failed. People are exhorted to be ready for the return of Jesus Christ over 50 times. So what should that tell you? Get ready. Get ready. Be ready. And then look for his coming. 50 times. Right? So if you walk out the door and I haven't called this to your attention, I would have failed at my job. Be ready when the Lord comes. So as we enter our study of the book of Revelation, be ready. The fact that could be included here is how many times before his death how many times before his death did Jesus himself predict his resurrection from the dead? How many? Three. Three. Excellent answer. Excellent answer. In the gospel, Jesus outright predicts his death and his resurrection three times. And then what happened? It happened. It happened. He prophesied it, and then he fulfilled it. 
He prophesied that he is coming for his church. We need to believe that, live our lives like we believe it, and look for it to happen at any moment. Amen. That's how we should be living our lives. Next slide, please, Lauren. So the bottom line here, I think, is who would study American history and leave out almost 30% of the textbook? Public schools. Public schools. <laughs> I grant you that one, Becca. <laughs> Yes. Or change the facts in it. We don't study prophecy. It's like tearing 30% of our Bible out. We're not going to do that. Right? Paul makes this important statement right here. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. I want you to be 100 percenters. Remember when we talked about that all that time ago? We want to be 100 percenters. We're not 99 and niners. We're 100 percenters. We are going to study the entire Bible. If the Lord should tarry, by the time he comes back, we will have covered the entire Bible. And that's what we want to, you know, stick into our brains. That's what I want. I want, when we go to, when we, when the Lord takes the church out, you know what he's going to say? This is what he's going to say. He's going to say, Sage Creek Bible Church, come on down. You guys studied the entire Word of God in church and on your own to teach some of these other guys as they come. That's what your job, that's what I want you to, your job to be. So whatever it takes, we are going to be students of the Word. Right? Amen. Right? Right, amen. <laughs> okay, we'll work on that. That's what I want. Next slide, please, Lauren. All right, here's your first verse in the book of Revelation. It isn't exactly the first book, verse in the book, but it's the first one we're going to look at, and then uh, we will circle back. Revelation 1, 3. Blessed is he who reads, who hears, and who keeps those things which are written in this book of prophecy. Right? We're going to circle back and get the other two verses in a bit, but... Uh, blessed, um, it means to be supremely blessed. Supremely blessed. I think what this is telling me is I'm not necessarily more blessed by reading the book of Revelation than, than like uh, uh, Lauren was just going through the book of 1 Peter in Sunday school and I thought did uh, just an amazing job. Learned a lot as he delved into that stuff and we were, we were supremely blessed, right? Amen. It was very much a blessing. But now, as we move into the book of Revelation, it will allow us to take the information uh, like Lauren's study, like uh, Jose's study on Wednesday night, on uh, you guys, those of you that are coming on board as teachers of the Word of God to the church, to put that all together and make it all fit, right? Gerhard Kittle. You guys ever heard of Gerhard Kittle? Yeah, Herb has. I know uh, a lot. Some of you, some of you that uh, get... Uh, Oh, more theological stuff. He wrote the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. And he says this word refers to the distinctive joy which comes through participation in the divine kingdom. That's what supremely blessed means. In other words, we're going to get some sight into what's yet to come, and we're going to be very blessed by that view. That's what he's telling us here. So the book of Revelation, by the way, is the only book in the Bible that contains this specific promise, that we will be blessed if we read it. But how often do churches read it? It's not a regular, and it should be. You know, it really should be. So this promise is threefold, and it applies specifically to this prophecy, the book of Revelation. We read this book, and we will be supremely blessed. That is what you must do. That's your, that's your calling. You must invest um, your time into the study of this book so that you will not be uh, a workman who is ashamed of the work. You've got to invest your time in this. Now, how many of you have ever heard of the Gideon app, the Bible on your phone? The Gideons have an app. We used it all the time. Um, Granny and I, uh, over some time, went through the, we went through the New Testament, was it 31 times? And we used the Gideon app on a lot of that. Uh, and then we went through the Old Testament twice using the Gideon app. 
and it changes your life, it changes your perspective. So uh, if you if you say okay, well I don't I, if you can listen in um, those earbuds, uh, and you can do that while you work or when I would recommend the Gideon app, and I would recommend the dramatized version. If you want to know how demons sound when they speak, <laughs> use the dramatized version. It's it's really special. Uh, Granny and I love it. So oftentimes when we go to out to visit. Uh, and thank you guys for the cookie support. It makes it, you guys are heroes to those folks out there because they don't get homemade stuff, except from you. You're the only source, and they love it. So we listen to the Bible, or we will do Billy Graham. But if you go through this and read, blessed is he who reads. Isn't that amazing? Blessed is he who reads. So in the early church, a lot of them were illiterate in the fact that they couldn't read letters. Uh, a lot of them couldn't read this, so they would have somebody who could read, stand up in their church service and read these things to them. Imagine their excitement as they realize God's plan for the future. They're hearing this for the first time. The amazing thing to me is that they're, they're putting the pieces together. They have put their faith in Christ, and now they realize that uh, he has a plan. He has a plan in the church, in our country today. We can read the entire Bible to include the book of Revelation in our own homes anytime we choose. And we ought to choose. So I'm asking you to choose. Read the book of Revelation. Read it. You don't have to understand everything you read. There's a lot of things we'll puzzle through. And as we get to the other side, we'll have, we'll have taken this Oregon Trail journey together as it weaves our way through the book. And when we get to the other side, when we get to the destination, I can guarantee you we will be supremely blessed because God said you would. You can get this blessing simply by reading his word with special emphasis on the book of Revelation. Okay? So please join me there. Let's go to the next slide. Next slide. Blessed is he who hears. And some of this is a little busy. And uh, I'm going to go quicker because of my time here. But just to hear the book of Revelation... And the other prophecies of the Bible read uh, is a great blessing in troubled times like we have in our modern world. You know what? I don't care who gets elected president. Do you think it will affect God's plan? No. Nope. Not a bit. Not one bit. I don't care who gets elected as senators. Will it affect God's plan? It won't. I'm telling you the one thing I've learned, and Granny and I have got some work to do. We're meeting with uh, the Gideon uh, organization on the 25th of September to get them more active out east in getting Bibles distributed to hospitals and hotels, things like that. We want to, we, we're, we're trying to get them going out east more. We've also got the gala at the hospital. We've got some stuff coming up that, um, uh, that I believe we will have an opportunity to speak about the Lord to those folks and let them know he has a plan. We're moving forward and we're working toward his coming. Amos 8.11 says this, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but for hearing the words of the Lord. Now, I believe this is a, prof a prophecy to Israel, but what it says to me is that man has an ear to hear the word. And as the Gentile world slips into the abyss of sin and filth, there will be a dearth of the word of God, but there will be those who want to hear. How do we get out of this? This tells me that legislation at the government level isn't the path ahead for us as we look to save the lives of unborn children, save the lives of our elderly, who some of these folks are looking to exterminate them. Legislation means nothing. What we have to do is look to God, look to his plan, preach the word, and see people come to the Lord. That's what we need to do. That's how we change it. That's why we're involved in capital ministries. We want to see our political leaders give their lives to the Lord, that they would bring the word of God to the legislation of our great state of Colorado and then to our nation. 
So there's a prophetic day coming when you look at this verse. When people will desperately want to hear God's word, but they will not be able to. When do you think that'll be? I think it's after the rapture. They'll be seeking the word of God. So what should we have in our homes, guys? What should we have? We talked about it. The rapture box. The rapture kit. That's right. We should have a rapture kit. Because when they come and take our house, because we won't need it anymore. We'll be gone. We'll be gone. Our modular on the, tr on the prairie will be unoccupied. They come and take our house. They won't know. There should be some word of God there that they open up and hear. This is what happened. This is where I am now. If you want to join me, put your faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, ma'am. There you go. So We're going to get there. I'm going to say they're going to hear it. And, you know, John talks about that multitude of white, the sea of white. Yep. For We're going to be there. The sea of white, by the way, those white robes, you know who's going to be ironing them and laundering them. And I don't want pleats in mine, Kirsten. You make it Heavy look good. Starch. I just have burn marks. Burn Heavy marks. Starch. Burn marks. <laughs> burn marks. <laughs> Nobody puts burn marks in my white robe. Uh, Matthew 13, 15. For this people, and that's great multitudes, their heart is waxed gross. Their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes, they have closed. This is our nation, right? Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. I want you, as we go through the book of Revelation, to see with your eyes, to hear with your ears, and understand with your heart. Right? And then we need to preach the gospel so that others may be converted as well and that God can heal them. And that's what, this is what we're up against today. We live among great multitudes who have closed their ears, closed their eyes. They don't want to hear. We need to crack through that somehow. And I think the path to do that is to preach, well, the gospel, but to let them know what's yet to come. And then to tell them that if you turn this offer from Jesus Christ down, where will your soul eternally abide? If you turn him down, where do you go? Hell. Hell. You'll end up in hell if you turn Jesus Christ down. You'll end up in hell. These messages need to be preached out there by churches and people as we deal with the, our loved ones and whatnot. So the only thing that will reach their ears, I think, is the preaching of the word of God and what is ahead. And we're at a time when only that's going to reach their hearts. But reading and hearing the book of Revelation really is not enough for us. Reading and hearing it is not enough. Next slide, please, Lauren. We as believers, we need to keep the word. We need to keep the word. And that means here to hold the book of Revelation tightly to our hearts. By implication, it means to obey it. We're called to diligently pay attention and watch. Our study in the book of Revelation should actually change how we order our lives. That's what I'm looking for for me. As I go through this book of Revelation, I want to make the changes to my life that God has directed that I make so that as I move forward, he would be pleased when he finds me, when he comes back for me. I think that's what we should do. Next slide, please, Lord. Any believer in Christ, any believer can receive this blessing of God simply by hearing, reading, and obeying it to the things that are in the book of Revelation and then the other scriptures that reveal God's end plan for human history. He says he will bless you. Why should we not take advantage? Why should we not? So to quote the words of one of the former patients that we had in hospice, a man named Leonard, why would anyone want to miss out on this blessing? That's what Leonard said after he got saved. A couple, three weeks later, I forget, it was somewhere down the road. We stopped in, we would talk about the Lord every week with Leonard, and he finally <coughs> said, why would anyone want to miss out on this blessing? Why would anyone want to? And he was thinking of the other, we call them inmates, in the nursing home. Why would any of those inmates want to miss out on this blessing? And what a question that is, isn't it? Why would anyone want to miss out? 
So the Lord has offered us, is to us, I will bless you if you read this book. Don't walk away from that blessing. It's on the table, ready for the taking. Next slide, please. Now the big question is, when will it happen? When is the Lord coming? Well, remember our verse, Revelation 1, 3, for the time is when? Near. near. The time is near. For the time is near. Are those words, by the way, when we say the time is near? Somebody give that to me in an ominous tone. The end. The time is near. The time is near. Or is it a, somebody now say the same words, but with a resounding hope. Somebody give that to me. Now don't make me do this myself. <laughs> huh? The time is near. Say it again. The time is near. The time is near. The time is near. Or the time is near. Ominous. Do you as a Christian find these words ominous? Or do you as a Christian find these words uplifting and full of hope? Uplifting and hope. Yeah, uplifting and full of hope. For the end is near. The answer that anybody would give you to that question depends on, are they looking for him? If you're looking for him, this phrase, the time is near, is a phrase of hope. It's a phrase of confidence, confident expectation. It's a phrase of excitement. It's all there. How close are we to the time? Next slide, please, Lauren. Well, <laughs> that was good. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Yeah, that was Justin that taught me how to do that. Okay. Romans 13, 11. I'd like you to turn there and puzzle through these verses with me for just a minute. Romans 13, 11. He says, and do this, we're following the Lord, knowing the time. Well, how does Paul say knowing the time? What is he referring to, knowing the time? He, in Revelations, he gives the birthing pains. Thank you. Showing that the time is near. He, he brings us to the prophetic writings. You are correct, Greg. Read, hear, and keep. That's the time, knowing the time. That now it is high time. Now is high time to awake out of sleep. Now is high time to awake out of sleep. Okay, tell me. You guys are looking at this. Tell me, what is Paul telling us when he says wake out of sleep? Does he mean just get up at 5 in the morning? What does he mean? Wake out of sleep. Tell me, what does he mean? Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Be, Kathy, I didn't hear yours. Alert. Alert. And diligent. And diligent. He's not just saying get up at 5 in the morning. He's saying it's high time. Now it is high time. The Lord could come back at any moment. It's high time to awake out of sleep. For now, now, this very moment, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Every second that ticks by, logically, we're closer to the coming of the Lord. And I want to go that way. I want to go as a church body where we all go together in the rapture and not one at a time. I don't want to do that. I'd rather just all of us go together. Yeah. Yep. Somewhere in Thessalonians, I think it says that our church will be first. And then... <laughs> it, amen? That makes me a little suspicious. Huh? That makes me a little suspicious. Why? Having us all go at the same time. Yeah, we'll all get there. Well, uh, uh, we'll all get there, but maybe not at the same time. Well, some <laughs> of us have to do the ironing of the robes before they're allowed in, Kirsten. <laughs> not to mention names. <laughs> God will humble you someday. <laughs> right? I like that phrase. What is he saying, though? What is he saying? Look at it with your believer eyes. What is he saying? As you open your Bible and you're sitting there and you say, our salvation is nearer than we first believed. Okay, well, that's true. Logically, that's true. But what is he saying? Be prepared. Be prepared. Exactly. He's saying, be prepared. The Lord is coming. It's at any moment, and any moment it draws closer. We should be more and more and more prepared. That's what Paul is saying. 
And then in verse 12, he makes that clear. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let's live our lives like we believe what we believe is really real. Okay? Cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, nor in lewdness and lust, nor in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Okay? So knowing, that means to know by seeing. And remember what we did, we see in the book of Revelation, it says, read, hear, keep. We see it there. Our eyes are on the word of God. Have your eyes on the word of God. Simply by seeing what is in the word of God, we can see God's time clock moving forward. It's what Paul is telling us. We're to read the word, we're to hear God speak by discerning its meaning, and then we're to keep it by obeying God's word. When we do that, we will fulfill what Paul is telling us. We will know the time, that it is high time. We'll see that as we go through the book of Revelation. The time, well, the time is now. He tells us right there. Where's the word now? For now... Our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Then there is the therefore. How many, a trivia question for you that doesn't, uh, I, it's a tough answer, but how many times do you think the word therefore shows up in the book of Romans? Just in the book of Romans. If you said 49, you would be correct. 49 times he says therefore. So it's important. Here the therefore is referring to the imminence of, of Jesus returning for us. Therefore, be ready. Knowing that the time of the return of Jesus is very near, maybe even now, Paul has some things that we must be working on. Slide 15, please, Lauren. This is your, uh, your rapture preparation checklist, okay? We've got our, we've got our, what's the packet we're gonna put in our houses? Our rapture packet? The rapture kit. The rapture kit, well, that's for the lost that come into your house after you're gone. How about you as you prepare for that? What's your checklist? Well, here it is. Paul gives it to us. Because the time is near, he says, cast off the works of darkness. Okay, that's my first checklist item. Right now. He says, right now, cast off the works of darkness. It means put away wicked deeds. Understanding that the master is coming. He's coming at any time. The second thing you've got to do, the second thing you've got to do, Paul says, is put on the armor of light. And this is in reference to the whole armor of God. Now, if I wanted to know about the whole armor of God, where would I go? Ephesians, Ephesians 6. Right. Then he says, walk properly as in the day, not in revelry, drunkenness, lewdness, lust, not in strife and envy. So we stay the course here. By using the weapons of the armor of God that he's given us, we stay the course. None of this can happen, okay? If you're caught in revelry, drunkenness, lewdness, lust, strife, envy, when Jesus comes back, what do you think that would do? Take away your rewards. You could lose rewards for it, sure. And you'd have to stand before uh, Jesus Christ. I think second for myself. I don't want to explain myself. I want to rejoice in Jesus Christ. But won't we be unable to explain ourselves? I think there we as believers, no excuse. I think the loss, that's true. The loss, that's very true, Greg. I think we have a closer relationship with the Lord than what we might imagine. The veil has been rent, we go into the Holy of Holies. Christ sit on his lap and talk, but we'll talk. Right? And then he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Be ready for my coming by putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Greek here gives us the sense of sinking into a garment. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So the clothes you see me wearing today, right? What I'm wearing today. They were purchased, they were prepared, and they were presented to me by Granny. Okay? You see me in the light of how she has prepared me to be seen. And at least the clothes look good. She is right in a clown outfit. In a clown outfit, she's done that. In the same way, in the same way, 
okay? Purchased, prepared, and presented, just like she did for me. That's what we're to do with Jesus Christ, right? He has purchased us, hasn't he? He has purchased us with his blood. He is presenting us to the world, and we need to, do pre we need to be prepared to do that well. We are to represent him well. I don't change oil in these clothes. When I get home today, I'll have to put on my old clothes and fix Granny's dishwasher. I won't do that in these clothes. Neither should we soil the reputation of the Lord before men by living in sin. We have put on Jesus Christ. We're born again believers in Jesus Christ. We should not soil the reputation of God to the world by living in sin. We're called to a higher life. We're called to a higher level. And we need to commit to taking that on. He says, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. If you don't want to be caught in the midst of sin when Jesus raptures you out, I need to walk every minute with the firm belief that he's coming soon, maybe even now, and live my life that way. This is your rapture preparation checklist. You want to be ready? Paul tells you how to be ready. Then slide uh, 16, please, Lauren. Here's your verse. Uh, is this the one, Becky, you had picked, I think? Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah are, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Do you think when you look around, we're kind of living in days like Noah did? Yeah, we're slipping down that road pretty fast. Uh, for in the days of, uh, before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Okay, when you look at this verse, what is the main point? What is the main point? Study this verse with me. You, and, and like I say, imagine tonight, you're in your devotions, you've opened your Bible and Here's Matthew 24, 36 to 38. Is the sinfulness of the people the main point? No. Or is it the unpreparedness for the event that brought the judgment? Unpreparedness for the event. And okay. I have an unpreparedness. Joseph? Uh, I was going to say is Noah just knew he was supposed to build an ark. He didn't know when the flood was going to come. Good he point. Didn't know. He didn't know. So certainly everybody else around him didn't know. Yeah. The Bible also talks about him he told everybody about the flood coming, but of course, no one can see a flood like that. No one can see a giant boat like that. So mm -hmm. that was crazy. Well said. Well said. That goes back to Becca's comment that they were unprepared for the event. The floods came and they were unprepared. That's what Jesus is calling out here. We have to be prepared. So we can take that lesson to heart, right? We need to be prepared when Jesus comes. Be prepared. Do your, do your rapture preparation checklist. Paul tells us how to be prepared. Next slide, please, Lauren. Therefore you... That's it. Whoa, did you see that transition? This is not an easy thing. Matthew 24, 44. Therefore you also be ready. You also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when, when, what? You do not expect. You don't expect. He goes on in 1 Thessalonians 5.1. Paul writes this. Concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. We won't, he, he hasn't told us the when. But what is the warning here? When you look at 1 Thessalonians 5.1, this is a warning for us to be prepared at all times for the coming rapture. Do your rapture checklist. Next slide, please, Lauren. I'm going to move quickly here so we can get to the end. Um, as we're living... Uh, oh, by the way, yeah, the last days are the end times. Uh, I want to spend some time, before we further go into the book of Revelation, defining these phrases for you, so that when you see them, you know what they mean. What, when we see these phrases, we usually think they mean we're living in the final days before the coming of the Lord. That's what we take them as. And to understand this, uh, is that accurate and what do they mean? Let's start with the phrase, end times. 
What does the end times mean? Uh, the end of this dis dispensation. Okay, I have the end of this dispensation. Let's remember that, okay? Keep that in mind. Uh, slide 19, please, Lauren. In the New Testament, end times, here we have uh, context means everything. When you look at the phrase end times, resist the urge to peel that phrase out. Put it in its context and see what's around it. Context means everything. The context of the verse you are studying enables you to know whether the Bible is speaking of the last days relating to Israel or the end times in reference to the church. Okay, there's a difference there. Yes, sir? I was going to say the phrase end times even in the Bible. Uh, in some translations, yeah. And we'll, we'll uh, uh, it, it's translated in various phrases like latter days. Uh, it might not, it's, uh, to answer your question, do I have, yeah, right here, right here, Joseph, Isaiah 2, 2. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days, and that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the, et cetera, et cetera. The book of Isaiah is written about Israel. Okay, the latter days uh, is oftentimes replaced by end times with the, with, uh, in people's brains. So I want to define the two so you know what's going on there. But I'm, um, now who screwed up our time? Me or you guys? Right. Who took my time? Who did we Huh? I think we all know the answer to that. Oh yes, we do. Don't even have a question. Huh? It was you guys. Oh. You guys took my time. We're gonna pick this up next week right here. We're going to define these words and figure them out before we look deeper into the Word of God so that as you come across those phrases, you know what they mean. Okay? You know what they mean. Any thoughts before we go? Any thoughts? How many of you have a rapture kit in your house right now? See, we need to do that. We need somebody to build us some rapture kits so we can put them on the fireplace mantle. So... We could do the Left Behind videos, but they won't have electricity to watch it. How do you know that? There'll oh. be electricity. Huh? There'll be electricity. There'll be electricity. How are people going to see the two witnesses rise from the dead except by <laughs> national or worldwide news? I have lost my crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, you can do it with Left Behind. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah.
About 70% of Daniel is already fulfilled. Why would I doubt the rest? So don't walk out of here today with any doubts in your mind that when Jesus says, I'm coming back for you, he's coming back for you. Don't screw around. Be ready when he comes. Be ready. Be ready, okay? My job is to probably not be popular, but to tell you what is yet to come. And that is that Jesus is coming, so live your life that way. So believers, let's commit our lives to living our lives like we really believe what we believe is really real, that he's coming. And anybody out in the, in the um, internet land, as Lauren and Kevin are taking us, um, we're not viral per se, but we're maybe just a little on the flu side or something, right? <laughs> so, yeah, if you don't know the Lord, in a faith-based relationship. If you haven't put your faith in Jesus Christ to save your soul, see yourself a sinner falling short of all that, don't walk out of here without that today. Because what's to come ain't fun. And I'm telling you, people that don't do that go to hell when they die. That's where they go. You either get saved by putting your faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, or you go to hell when you die. And where does that come from? The Word of God. So don't kid around with your soul. Don't gamble with eternity. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, Gus, I know your back is bad. Are you okay to pray? Mm -hmm. You got to come up and do that. Yep. Okay. And uh, if I can uh, uh, get our other deacon to join him. We'll have deacons closing us today. I imagine in the New Testament church in the early days, you got to come up here. That microphone doesn't get picked up by, is what I'm told. No, you got to see you. Yeah, you got to be in front of that microphone. Yeah. No, no, no not that one. On the camera. That one. The camera. On the tripod. Right in front of you. Not there. Podium <laughs> mic. The podium mic. Get the whole thing. Don't we have the, listen, we have the best deacons in the world, I'm just saying. Not uh, that mic, that mic over there sitting back there. <laughs> right. All right. Can, can, I'm going to start right now. All right. Heavenly yeah. Father, thank you for bringing us together today. Thank you for this time in your word. Thank you for helping us to, uh, to better understand what, uh, uh, what we have in front of us. And Lord, we pray that you help us to uh, be prepared, be ready, um, constantly um, looking toward you. And uh, Lord, we, uh, we pray that, uh, um, well, Lord, we pray for our lost brothers, and our lost family members and friends who, who don't have this hope, that, uh, that you would help us to uh, bring them closer to you. And uh, Lord, we, uh, we pray for your kingdom to come, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Our Father in heaven, in closing, I'd like to agree with Gus, all the things that were just brought before your throne. Uh, I want to thank you for understanding how we need to know the future, how we can interpret the future, and what we can expect. And I want to thank you for that. Uh, we have some guests here today. I want to thank you for them. We have two that are going to be leaving right away. We ask that you'll just go before them now. <coughs> Grant them safe traveling mercies. We ask that you'll supply all their needs according to your riches and glory. And uh, we look forward to seeing, seeing them again someday. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray all these prayers, Father. Amen. 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 Thank you.